Hi, I'm Christina May, the online pastor at World Harvest Church in Enid, Oklahoma. You're about to hear a spirit-filled message from our pastor. So grab your Bible, and if you're a coffee lover like me, grab a cup of coffee and get ready for a personal word that God has for you today. Grab your Bibles. We're going to dive right into the Word of God today. Uh, We've had an incredible time in our message, I mean, in the the worship, but I know God's going to speak to us through our message today also. And so I I know there's a word in season for each and every one of us. Uh, I always love coming to church. Not only do we have great worship, but I believe the Lord always speaks to us in the Word too. Amen? He's going to do that today. So let's bow together and let's pray once again before we dive in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this uh, incredible time we've already had with you here today in this place. Lord, just the worship, we we sensed you so beautifully and uh, felt your presence here in our time together. And uh, we know that you're always just right there. You never leave us, you never forsake us, Lord God. Lord, we've been reminded of that through the time we've had with you already, even through the communion time. Lord, now there's a word I believe that you want to speak to each and every one of us here today, Lord God, a word in season. Lord, we don't want to come together just to have another church service, just to have another Sunday in a a place of of worship, but Lord, we want to connect with you, we want to hear from you, and more importantly, we want to take you into the world that we're going to go into this next week. So speak to us, Lord, let us see what you want us to see, let us hear what you want us to hear today. In your name we pray, and everybody say it with me. Amen. Open up your Bibles with me now to the, or click in your devices to the book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11. And last week we finished up on a great series entitled Missio Day, talking about the mission of God. But we're going to shift gears a little bit and move into what I really do believe is a word in season for us as individuals and word for us as a church. I've entitled it simply this, staying in the game. Look at your neighbor right quick and tell them, you gotta stay in the game. Stay in the game. I want you to look at a story here in the Old Testament. It's a story of David. David is one of these guys that we know a lot about, we read a lot about. David, the guy who stood out on the battlefield as a, long, as a young teenage boy who slew Goliath. I mean, did a magnificent feat, just incredible what God did. But this story that we're about to read is later on in David's life. A lot of life has transpired. He is the king of all of Israel. I mean, he is just, the the kingdom has just been established in a huge way. They become a dominant nation. But I want you to see a story that took place in David's life. It's in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel Starting out in verse one, let's read a few of these verses here. In the New Living Translation, it says, in the spring of the year, maybe kind of like now, how many of y'all enjoying this warmer weather? I've been enjoying, but we had some beautiful days, right? In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and they laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However... If you've got your paper Bible or your device, you can highlight this portion or mark it somehow and encourage you to do so. But however, David, what did he do? It says, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Verse two, late one afternoon, after his midday rest, I mean, wow, man, right there we see how many of y'all know rest are holy? I mean, it's it's in the word of God. I can't wait till this afternoon. I'm going to rest, man. After his midday rest, David got out of bed and he was walking on the roof of the palace. And as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Oh, no, David. Verse three, he sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told she is Bathsheba. The daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Verse four, then David. Everybody say, don't do it, David. Then David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the palace, what happened? He slept with her. Oh no, oh no, David. She had just completed her purification rites. If you jump down with me to verse five, later when Bathsheba Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, dude, you got me pregnant. That's my trance, that's my twist to it. (laughs) 
So suddenly David is forced or found himself in a dilemma that was not good. He made a mistake, did something that was bad, did something that was wrong. He slept with this girl. She got pregnant. And I wish I could say that was in the story, but it gets worse. He finds out she's pregnant. Uriah, her husband, is one of his mighty men who's fighting the battle. So he's like, oh no, I'm gonna be, re- it's gonna be exposed. Everybody's gonna know what happened. So he comes up with a plan. How many of y'all know whenever a person finds, finds himself in sin, they always try to find a way to cover it up, right? So they, what does he do? He uh, calls back her husband from the battlefield with the mindset, he'll come home, he'll sleep with his wife. That way we can tell everybody that the baby she's carrying, it's Uriah's, everybody be going happy. Come on, how many of y'all know many times when you try to make your strategies to cover over sin, it never works out. Same way. Uriah was so committed to the country and to his fellow warriors He didn't go home to sleep with his wife. He went home and slept on the porch and went back to the battle. So suddenly David's like, this is not, this plan is not going well. And so he tells Joab, the commander of the army, he says, when you're in the heat of the battle, he said, put put, uh, Uriah at the front and then withdraw your warriors. And sure enough, David gets the message back. He said, Uriah has been killed. We withdrew the words just as you asked. David, in his effort to cover up a mistake, to cover up a sin, he committed adultery, he lied, he committed murder. And it was not until the prophet Nathan came to him and and gave him a story that it was revealed the sin that David committed. Now, why am I telling you this story? The reason why I believe that I'm telling you the story is this, David messed up, he got himself into a big mess solely because he was not where he should have been. Why did David not, as the scripture we just read, it says in the time of year that the kings go out to war, David, what did he do? He stayed home. Why did David, why, what caused him not to be where he was supposed to be? I don't know, the Bible does not tell us. We could theorize that maybe David, after so many years of serving, so many years of being king, maybe he was just tired. Maybe he was tired of the life he was living. Maybe he was like, you know what? You guys go to the battle, I'm just tired. I don't know. Maybe he got to this place of success in his life. The kingdom had been established. Great things had happened. Maybe he was like, you know what? I am special now. I'm somebody. You guys go do the work. I'm going to kick back. I'm going to enjoy life on all the, you know, I'm going to enjoy the harvest of everything that I've planted. I don't know. All I know is this, David should have been on the battlefield. He should have been engaged in the battle, but instead of being engaged in the battle, he decided to hang back. Had David become complacent? I don't know. I want you to think back with me here just over the last several months that we have lived, all of us together over these last, we can go back, I mean, you know, 16 to 18 months. Y'all remember January and February of 2020? If you can go back and remember pre-COVID. Anybody remember pre-COVID days? I remember here at the church, man, I'm excited about what God's doing in the year 2020, 2020, the year of tremendous vision, you know, all this stuff. I mean, January, February, God is moving in our church. Church services are packed out. We're seeing new people come. We're talking to people in the community, key leaders in the community. They're talking about wanting to come to World Harvest Church. March hits. Like, woo, man, we're excited. We start hearing this rumors of this little COVID-19 thing. You know, we started hearing this rumors that, you know, Europe started shutting down. We started hearing this stuff. You know, the American government's going to shut everything down. I'm like, there is no way. There is no way we're ever going to shut down. There, you know, everybody's going to have to start wearing masks. There's no way we're going to wear Anybody remember those days? Yeah. There's no way. And then suddenly, you know, late March, we find ourselves in a situation. We had to close the church doors for six weeks. I had to preach to empty chairs, just me and a camera. I hated it. 
never want to do that again, but if I have to, I'll do it. I never want to do that again. Come on, y'all. But it wasn't just COVID that we had to face. Y'all remember everything else? There was the racial tensions. There was the political divisions, all this mess. You remember our world was literally in an uproar. But what did that cause us to do? If you trusted in God, if you believed in God, what were you doing? I mean, I don't know about you, but I prayed more in the last 12 months than I ever prayed in my life. I sought God more. Man, I'm getting scriptures more. I'm worshiping more. I am in the zone. I am like, you know, uh, like a game. How many of y'all ever played sports before? Anybody play sports before? Or anybody still playing sports? At the age of my life, I am a pickleball player. I, I picked up pickleball a couple years ago. I love pickleball. Man, if you have never played pickleball, man, you need to come out and play some pickleball with me because I like beating people. And so come out, play some pickleball. But there's one thing that I've learned. There's a difference between going to the YMC and just playing for exercise versus playing in a tournament game. Yesterday, my son Bryce and I got to play in a tournament. It was uh, our second year of playing in a tournament. And so yesterday for, from uh, 7.30 in the morning until two in the afternoon, I played pickleball. I played so much pickleball, I'm tired of pickleball. Don't ask me to play pickleball today. I'm not gonna play with you. We played 15 games of pickleball, but there's something that I noticed when I am in a tournament, when I am in a game, my headspace is totally different from other days of the week. I am geared up, the adrenaline's flowing. Come on, how many of y'all guys remember the sports, man? You're in the zone. You, you know, every shot, every move, everything is so strategic. You are in the zone. You are in the game. Now, this is what I believe the Lord is saying. We have come now into a season, what we're calling post-COVID season, right? The political environment is still weird right now, but it's not like it was a few months, several months ago. COVID is real, but it's not like it was several months ago. Come on, there's still tensions, social tensions, but it's not quite like it was a while back. This is what I believe that we got to be aware of. Like me, after the tournament, I was geared up. I was ready to go. But let me tell you, by the moment I got home, I was so wiped out. I crawled myself into bed and slept. I was just like, I am out. I'm checked out. I'm done for the day. Don't ask me, honey, to do anything around the house. You know, I am resting. This is what I believe the Lord is saying. We are now entering into a season that many are checking out spiritually. You have fought some battles. You have fought the fight. Church, we cannot be guilty of doing what David did, saying, you know what? Y'all go fight the battle. I'm gonna hang back. Because it's in those, now let me say, there, there's nothing wrong with taking a rest, all right? Here in three weeks from today, I'm gonna to bring a message of how important it is to stay in the game. You gotta have moments of rest, okay? I'll talk about that in the future. But this is what I wanna talk about here today is this. We gotta stay in the game. We gotta stay engaged. Because some of y'all here today, you're in the middle of the battle. The battle's intense. But some of y'all, you're kind of like, man, things are kind of working out right now. I've had a lot of extra money come into my pockets here over the last several months. I've been able to do some things. I'm a little more financially stable. Life is pretty, let me tell you, there will always be a battle to fight on this side of heaven. And we've got to be careful that we don't become lethargic or we don't become complacent with our life that we're not ready for the next battle. Listen to what the definition of complacent is. Let me give it to you right quick. Complacent means this. It is this. It's pleased, it's especially with oneself or one's merits, advantages, its situation, etc. Listen to this. Often without awareness of some potential danger. What are you saying, Pastor? This is what I'm saying. The enemy doesn't take a vacation. I'm always glad about summertime because things slow down a little bit. We don't have near as many church activities as we normally have during the fall and during the springtime. We, we don't have many, as many things going on, but this is what I know. I'd like to take a vacation in the summertime, but the enemy who comes to steal, to kill and destroy my life doesn't take a vacation. And so the enemy, I believe, is always just waiting for us to let our guard down. Kind of like David, he let his guard down and he found himself in a place he shouldn't have been and he ended up doing something he shouldn't have done. 
God forbid that any of us, that we fall into the same trap, we get complacent, we get lethargic with our life, and we find ourselves back in the problem that we maybe came out of, or we're in a new set of situations and new problems. Come on, look at somebody beside you and tell them, I gotta stay in the game. Come on, tell them, you gotta stay in the game. So how do we combat? How do we avoid complacency? Let me give you something here that Paul tells Timothy, a young, uh, for all my Star Wars fans here today, his young Padawan in 2 Timothy chapter one. 2 Timothy chapter one, look at it with me real quickly here. New Living Translation, 2 Timothy chapter one. Click in your device or turn in your Bibles. This is about where I miss the old days of preaching the word. Because back in the old day when I told people to turn in their Bible, man, you'd hear all this, all these pages, pages turning. You know, I'm still trying to get into this new mindset with all the technology. Click in your device, turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter one. We need to get a soundtrack for me sometime. When I say turn your Bible, you hear the, anyway, that's just me. 2 Timothy chapter one, verse five. I want you to see something here that Paul tells young Timothy. Now, Timothy is a guy that was, grew up under Paul. Paul mentored him, he mentored him, he trained him in ministry, and then he positioned him, he put him into a church, into some responsibility. He said this, verse five, chapter one, 2 Timothy. Now, those of you that are using handout notes, I messed up, I made a mistake. It's not 1 Timothy, it's 2 Timothy chapter one, not 1 Timothy chapter two, all right? 2 Timothy chapter one, verse five says this. I remember your what? Genuine faith for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. Do you see this? Verse six, this is New Living Translation. That is why I remind you to, everybody say it with me, fan into flames. Fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you when I laid hands upon you. And then it goes into verse seven, a very famous passage of scripture that every one of y'all have heard before. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power, love, and self-discipline or a sound mind, if you know it from the New King James. Now here he says to fan into flames. I believe that the apostle Paul, the greatest teacher of all times, he understood something, that what God puts in us is kind of like fuel in our car. You guys know what fuel is for your car, right? If you use your car, what are you doing? You're depleting the fuel. And you get to a certain level, you gotta stop and put more gas into it, right? And there's probably been many of y'all here that have experienced moments where you didn't take time to put fuel in your car and you paid for it. Not literally cash, but you paid for it because you ran your car out of gas. You had a problem. Paul tells young Timothy to do what? To, re, to fan, fan into flames again. If you've ever had a fire, if you've ever started a fire, you take a bunch of wood, you light the thing on fire, that thing burns down, you're still left with these embers. But every, many of y'all know you can take those same embers, you can throw some more wood at it, you can stir that up, and before too long, you have a fire again. This is what Paul's talking about. In the New King James and some of the other translations, I love what it says there. He says to stir it up, to stir up. Everybody say stir it up. Stir it up. And any time I think about this passage of scripture, I cannot help but thinking about one of my favorite analogies, one of my favorite things in life is I like chocolate milk. Come on, where's all my chocolate milk lovers here in the church today? Come on, every chocolate milk lover. Now I like mine nice and cold milk. I don't like syrup, I like the powder. Come on, any powder lovers here today? The Nestle's quick, Hershey's, whatever, yeah. Nestle, quick, the bunny, the bunny, all right. Ooh, I love the bunny. Anyway, this to me, in my opinion, this is totally subjective, makes the best chocolate milk. Come on, every chocolate milk lover, you got your certain ratio of powder that you put in to a cold glass of milk, mm. Don't mind if I do, pretty good, pretty good stuff. Now, every good chocolate milk lover, if you use the, the, the powder, what happens when the milk that you have made, the chocolate milk, what happens when it becomes steel? What happens to this cup of milk when there's no activity? Anybody know what's that, knows what happens to a lot of that chocolate that's been mixed into that milk? What happens to it? Falls to the bottom. Because of inactivity, it slowly the, the, the elements that are inside, the, the, it's heavier, it begins to float to the bottom. 
Now, when it floats to the bottom and ends up at the bottom, come on, every good chocolate milk lover knows, does that ruin your chocolate milk? What do you do? All you have to do is just take the spoon. And what do you do? You got to stir it up again. Oh, yeah. So if I was a kitchen utensil today, guess what I would be? I'd be a spoon. Because my intention for all of us here today is this. I want to stir you up because for some that are hearing my voice right now, there are things that God has put inside of you. There are gifts, there are talents, there are blessings. There, there's encouragement, there's peace, there's joy that God has placed inside of you but because you have been complacent, because you've been lethargic in your walk with God, those things have settled. See, I believe the answer for your life and for the victory that you need is not necessarily getting something to you that you don't know, but it may simply be getting something stirred back up inside of you that you've learned in your past. Amen. We live in such a content rich era. I can pretty much guarantee you that you've got some word of God in you. If you'll just use what's in you, you'll find yourself walking in a place of victory. You'll find yourself at a place of joy. You'll find yourself at a place of peace. It's it's not because you're lacking something. It's just because you've let things settle. So what do you got to do? Come on, man. You got to stir it up. Come on, everybody say stir it up. Look at your neighbor and tell him you got to stir it up. Pardon for just a second. I got to have some more. Another shot, another shot. This is what Paul is telling Timothy. Now, let me give you, now, those of you that are tracking along in your notes, you're like, Pastor Brad, you're still in your introduction. Yeah, I know, I know. But you can rest assured, I've got three points to give you, but I'm only gonna give you one. There's two more points you can go back and study on your own. So let's dive into this here for just these few moments that we got together left here. Let me give you a primary way to stir it up, all right? Because I've shared this with you before, you're not gonna have me on your shoulder every day of your week saying, come on, stir it up. Come on, man. You know, you're not going to have a little bobblehead, Pastor Brad Mendenhall sitting in your car saying, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. Maybe that's not a bad marketing idea. I don't know, but (laughs) there's something that you can do to keep things stirred up in your life. And the primary way to do is to remember. Everybody say, remember. Remember, I want you to see something again, staying along with the, the David, but let's go back to the earliest story of his life in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want you to see this. Young David, young teenage boy, finds himself on the battlefield. He has taken a bunch of supplies for his brothers that are fighting in the Jewish army. And he gets there and he finds out that they're facing the Philistines and there's a champion out there. His name is Goliath. He's been taunting the children of Israel. He's been basically saying, you pick a champion, come out and fight me. Whoever wins, that's the winner of this battle. We don't all have to fight. David shows up. All the Israelite army is cowered in fear. David's like, who does this guy think he is? He doesn't have a covenant with God. What are you guys afraid of? David, get the picture, young kid. Kind of like some of these teenagers. Well, they're, they're kind of growing up here on the front row up here. Man, don't you love having these young people up here on the front row? Man, I love it. He says, I'll go out and fight him. So King Saul hears about it. So they bring David in. And King Saul's basically like, what are you thinking? You're gonna go fight Goliath? I want you to see David's response. Verse 34. 1 Samuel 17, verse 34. But David persisted. He said, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from my flock, verse 35, he said, I go after it. I go after it with a club and rescue that lamb from its mouth. And if the animal turns on me, he says, I catch it by the jaw. (laughs) David has a man's man. He said, I club it to death. That kind of gets me excited. I'm an outdoor guy. I love the outdoors, but man, I've got my gun. I've got my, you know, 22, 250 or my 243 or seven millimeter. Mac David didn't have that stuff. He says, man, I went after a lion and I went after a bear. I didn't shoot him. I clubbed him. Hey, it reminds me, several years ago, I was hunting in Colorado. I was elk hunting in Colorado. I'm sitting in front of this a big old clearing kind of went up the side of the mountain and I hear a, a, a bunch of oak brush or something. I thought there was a big elk coming out and there was a mama bear with two cubs coming out of this oak brush, coming out of this little clearing that I was overlooking. Now, this mama bear, she only is probably about two or three years old. She was no higher than my knee, no, no, no that big, but two cubs. And of course, outdoor, I'm like, oh, and I tell you, that bear had this track and her trajectory was gonna come right by about 10 feet in front of me as I kind of quickly drew a line in my head at the, where she was coming out of here. And I'm like, that bear doesn't even know I'm here. 
There was nothing inside of me that said, I wonder if I could jump on the back of that bear and kill that bear. Even though it was a little bitty bear, I tell you the hair, I kind of got this back problem all of a sudden. I had this big yellow streak running through it, you know what I mean? And so I'm like, I got my gun out. I'm like, ah, a bear. (laughs) And here's David. Bear showed up, I killed that sucker. A lion showed up, I clubbed that sucker to death. I know about you, that's pretty tough. But I want you to see what David said, verse 36. I have done this to both. Now this is intriguing to me. Lions, what does it mean if you take a noun and put an S at the end of it? It means not just one, but multiple. He said, I've done this to lions and to bears. He said, I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he's defied the armies of the living God. Verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. In other words, David, he understood the power of remembrance. And as he faced, as he faced this Goliath in his life, he wasn't looking at the size of Goliath. He was remembering the covenant he had with God and who he was. And he said, you know what? I've been through challenges in my past and I remember the lions, I remember the bears and bless God, if God was with me with the lions and the bears, I know that he's gonna be with me now in front of this Goliath. He had the power to remember. Those of you that know the story of David and Goliath, there's a verse I wanna show you right quick that many people don't realize is there. It's in verse 54. So David, he steps out, he slays Goliath, he kills Goliath with a stone. I love the story because it says he took Goliath's uh, his own sword and he chops off the head of Goliath with the guy's own sword. Now, to me, because, you know, I, I kind of graphic type of a situation, I just wonder how many hacks it took to chop off. I just wonder how much blood was flying. He's like, key, key, key. But he finally knocks, cuts the head of Goliath off. And then he says he takes that head around. And man, I don't know if you, that's like, that's a, that's a dude, man. That's a man's man right there. But it's pretty interesting. Verse 54, verse 54. It says, David took the Philistine's head to Jerusalem. But look at this last part of that. But he stored the man's armor in his own tent. In his own tent. He didn't take it to Saul. He put the armor in his tent. Now, I can't prove it. But I do understand that David was able to wrap his mind around the importance of remembering because he remembered the lions. He remembered the bears. I'm just wondering if he brought the armor of Goliath into his tent so it'd be a memento for what God did in that moment. I, I don't know it. I can't prove it. But I wonder when David was ruling as the king of Israel, I wonder that if off to the side of the throne room somewhere was this trophy case of Goliath's armor? I don't know. Maybe it was. I, I know this for me. He's talking about pickleball. You know, um, yesterday, Bryce and I got to play in the tournament, like he said, but we sucked. <laughs> it was terrible. We got fourth place. We should have got at least second place. <laughs> but I do remember a year ago when Bryce and I played the same tournament, we got first place in our division. I'm like, well, I got a, I got a first place medal. First medal I ever got in my life was a first place gold medal. I was hoping somebody just like, good job, Pastor Rabbit. I know, that was a year ago. But I left that tournament like, we suck. But then I remember, no, last year we won. <laughs> I don't know if David had those moments, like I suck. But maybe he looked over at that armor and said, you know what? Oh, I remember what God did. I remember. Let me give you a scripture here in Psalms right quick as we start to close. Psalm 77, look at these few verses. I want you to see a progression of attitude in these verses. It starts out in verse seven. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never again be kind to me? Verse eight, is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed. It sounds like this guy is at the bottom, right? Verse nine, has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he slammed the door on his compassion? Verse 10, listen to this. And I said, this is my fate. The most high has turned his hand against me. They could almost add the hee-haw song in there, gloom, despair, and agony on me. Verse 11, but... 
But then I recall. Can I say it this way? But then I remember all that you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. Do you see a progression of attitude? Do you see a perspective shift? Goes from poor me to all of a sudden it's like, you know what, God, you did it before. You can do it again. Amen. Here's my challenge to every one of us here today. What has God done for you? I told you, you know, a pickleball medal. It's something special to me. It's not that big a deal, I understand, but it's still special to me. But you know, I remember back August 20th, 1988, this piece of metal that I wear around my finger. It's not expensive either. It's, I wanted a cheap one so I didn't have to worry about messing it up. It's not a piece of jewelry, so to speak. You know what it is? It's a reminder of a covenant and agreement that me and that good-looking, sexy woman right on the front row entered into on August the 20th of 1988. I remember that. 32 years, I remember that. Every time I pull onto these, this property, I, when I see this cross that's back here in the back, I know what it is. It's a cross. It reminds us, but it's, it's more to me. Because remember after we bought this land, was trying to build a building and it just seemed like nothing was happening. But I remember we had a, a lineman who worked on high line poles. Uh, he was coming to our church at that one time. And he said, hey, what about putting a cross up at the property? I'm like, hey, great idea. So he built that cross that's out there and it doesn't look that big now. But back when we put it in the ground, it was just a wheat field out here. And kind of the funny part of the story is this. I remember because he came out with his big old lineman truck. We'd had this big rain. He comes out here, got, gets halfway off the road to where the cross is out there and just bogs down and gets stuck. So he called another one of his friends out. He come out. The guy comes out and hooks up to him. He gets stuck. Another guy comes out. He gets stuck. I come out in my Ford truck, my old three-quarter ton four-wheel drive Ford truck. I hook on to him. We all got stuck. But somebody had the brilliant idea. Let's all put it in four-wheel drive. Let's all go at the same time. And we all got out of there at the same time. It's pretty cool. We had this train of about five different trucks out there all hooked together. We got out of it. So when I th see the cross, I, of course, I think about Jesus and what he's done for me, but it has more meaning to me. I think about what God has done here in this church when this was nothing more than a wheat field. We moved into this building in September 2015. We're going into five years, you know, in our fifth year of being in this building. And right after we moved into this building, Mike Hoffman, many of y'all know Mike, he made this great big old picture of this beautiful built picture of the church building that I've got back in the room that I use for my office during the week time. I walk into my office back here so many times a week. I look at that picture and I'm like, wow, I remember. I remember all those years was praying and believing for this place. I remember that time and I remember now what God's done. So here's my challenge. If God's done something for you, identify at least two things that God has done. David said, I've killed the lion, I've killed the bear. What are the two things? Just, and I don't know many of y'all have more than two things. What are two things that God has done in your life? Write them down. And if you wanna go this step further, get a memento for it. Whatever, whether it's a picture on the wall, whether it's a necklace or something, something that will cause you when you look at that that you remember. Because if God did it before, guess what? You haven't exhausted his grace. You haven't exhausted his miracles. If God did it before, guess what? He's gonna do it again. You need God to show up in your life? Stir yourself. Stir your faith up. Amen. Thanks again for listening. We hope that this message inspires, challenges, and fuels you up to take a real Jesus to a real world. If you'd like to connect with us in any way, please go to harvestenid.com slash connect. Or if you'd like to learn more about us as a church, please go and check us out at harvestenid.com. We can't wait to share another message with you next week.